for questions uh, from you, although we're kind of squeezed for time and realize people have to get out. We'll begin with Scott Bain, uh, Chief Litigation Counsel and Director of Internet Anti-Piracy Efforts with the Software uh, and Information Industry Association, a trade association of the United States software and digital publish publishing industries. In that capacity, and in his former position at the RIAA, he's seen from the inside the strategy struggles of content industries trying to control infringement online. After Scott, we'll hear from Ron Coleman of Get Fitzpatrick, uh, and master of the popular likelihood of confusion, our blog. Ron litigates both sides of copyright disputes. Uh, most relevant for our purposes, he's blogged about the Right Haven lawsuits and filed an amicus brief challenging Right Haven's entitlement to statutory damages. And finally, we'll hear from the man at the eye of the storm, Right Haven CEO Steve Gibson. Uh, Steve has largely planned and executed Right Haven's litigation efforts, which Right Haven views as critical to preserving a viable business model for the newspaper industry in the future. Good morning. I want to thank the, the uh, society for, for inviting me. I think it's great to have a group where as soon as you join, they ask you to be on a panel. <laughs> um, I, uh, I also, I, uh, having thank you, let me now apologize because the downloadable materials, besides being massively large, um, should have been edited. There's repetition in there and there are unnecessary pages and stuff in there. And I, I'm sorry about that. Then again, memory is cheap these days, right? And we all have broadband, so, you know, let's move on. Now, one, one thing that was in there, though, you might find a little bit odd. I'm not showing off that in 1995 I wrote an article in the ABA Journal about about the future and exciting world of internet related law. What I'm actually suggesting is is that we take a sense is that is to look at that article and get a sense of um, how far we've come and, and in many ways how far we've not come. A lot of the questions that were addressed in that article when the internet was was really nascent um, have not been resolved. And they include much of what we're talking about today, although I wouldn't have predicted necessarily that we'd be having precisely the conversation that we have. Well, if I would have, it would have been in the article. Um, one final point of an introductory nature is that bloggers do not yet get to file amicus briefs. I filed the amicus brief on behalf of the uh, Media Bloggers Association, uh, not merely because I've got a blog. It hasn't come to that point yet. Uh, and even I would not suggest that it should. Um, let us not be motivated when considering these issues by criticism over law, by, by virtue of being lawyers who resent the fact that there are people who know how to make a lot more money than we do, especially when it's other lawyers. Uh, moreover, let, let it be very clear that there's nothing in the, in the philosophy of the Media Bloggers Association, and I, I do speak on their behalf, since I'm half of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have a membership. I mean, there's just Bob Cox and, and me, and he says whatever you, Ron, you know, in the law stuff, whatever you say, fine. So I don't have to disclaim it. Uh, bloggers understand and are charged to understand that our position is that the copyright infringement is not cool because you're a blogger. It's not cool because it's on the internet. Uh, bloggers write content. Bloggers write stuff that is and should be protected under copyright. On the other hand, they tend not to be particularly well uh, educated in this respect, which is true of most people. Now, the question here really is about overreaching. Overreaching in the trademark and copyright areas has created a situation that uh, many of us have been arguing has only been a matter of time in terms of the judicial and public opinion backlash. Uh, in the trademark area, the backlash has been a lot slower in coming. Uh, it, it's a little bit more complex. Fundamentally, we've got a problem with copyright and trademark being used as stalking horses for anti-competitive for litigation that's meant to act as a way of competing with new distribution models or, or, or new forms of competition. Uh, little by little, judges are beginning to be a little bit less or automatically oriented to protect a copyright or a trademark holder merely because they've got some kind of certificate or registration and are beginning to take a closer look at what's really going on in a lawsuit. Uh, the issue in copyright is, is, is much better developed. First, the cultural issue, which Scott alluded to. 
I, I think um, with all due respect to his client, there's little or no respect in the broader population now for the legal rules that govern the use of other people's copyright protected material. I'm not in favor of that. I don't think anyone here should be. I, I'm not the lawyer as you are. Um, but we've gotten to the point because of uh, the, the, the models that we've chosen, and they're not irrational, but I've gotten to the point where, where we have lost that educational battle, in my opinion, and I understand that Scott has a different view on it, and I imagine that Steve does also. In the courts regarding copyright, uh, by virtue of, of, of what I have described as overreaching, we've got results such as rulings expanding or at least taking to the furthest known bounds of fair use in decisions such as Wright Haven versus uh, JAMA, the CIO case, where the court ruled that, heck, an entire article could be reprinted and it's still fair use. Now, we all know the fair use factors, and we know that there is nothing in the fair use factor that says an entire article could never be fair use, but we also have a kind of a general rule of thumb when we're advising our clients. First, tell me you're not reprinting the whole article, then let's work from there. And now, now what have we got? Well, we, when you've got judges who are annoyed, sometimes uh, I think the phrase was bad facts make bad law. Um, you've got an increased judicial focus on the market loss prong of the fair use analysis. I think more than ever was the case. Yes, we had the, the Gerald Ford case, um, and we have celebrities, but now looking at Wright Haven, that's an argument that we hit very hard in our amicus brief, which is that it, how can the court justify awarding statutory damages in the six figures for works whose market value is in the single <laughs> digit dollars? Um, and, and, and arguably there has been a, a sea change in what has, I think, for a very long time and a very warm reception in the courts, a copyright infringement claim, and understandably so. Mass enforcement in the RIAA and MPAA um, model has, to a large extent, because of the famous, as you, as you point out, Scott, the case is focusing on grannies and, and you know, half-witted college students downloading songs and finding themselves practically uh, engaged in a perp walk, you know, there's been a complete delinking from any concept of blameworthiness or intent. You don't have to be blameworthy and you don't have to have intent to be uh, liable for copyright infringement, but that's not how people understand law, justice, fairness, and equity. So that's a cultural issue, not a legal issue. And people are very, very aware of the disproportionate amount of fees, uh, legal fees, and uh, statutory penalties that are being demanded in cases where they know no, nothing in the nature of uh, the damage incurred would seem to justify it. So as a result, I, I, think, I think there is actually con a consensus among the greater population that the ma mass enforcement is essentially ineffectual. Uh, and, and I think that a proof of that is the fact that those who are engaged in it are constantly seeking more and better tools. They want whatever it is that they're doing now works so well, they want higher statutory damages, they want the ability to make or have the Department of Homeland Security make seizures of websites, ex party. Um, the, it's true that some interim deterrent is being affected. I, I would never I would never deny that. But uh Hard to imagine that, that it balances out. I believe that it has caused a crystallization of an anti-copyright, anti-establishment sensibility among the militant downloaders and, and by targeting non-militants who act either out of ignorance or because they're casual scoff laws, they've made anti-copyright, anti-enforcement feelings much more common. And then there's the fact that people are aware that the RIAA paid its lawyers in 2008 $16 million dollars for $391,000 worth of income in settled cases. Uh, and I have to remind you again, not to, we should not make our criticisms motivated on those who know how to make money better than we do. And if I would have been part of that $16 million, I might not be up here sitting here having that complaint again <laughs> today. And because I am not, I am punishing them all by writing my blog and having this. <laughs> So, given all that situation, it's predictable that we would see trolling, as it's called, or what we might kindly more call infringement litigation arbitrage, uh, such as Wright Haven, develop. It's built to maximize the extraction of rent, as the economists put it, 
as in all arbitrage situations, where you optimize the opportunity for revenue by exploiting otherwise marginal aspects of a regime that isn't really meant to deliver those kind of results. Copyright is not about generating attorney's fees. It's not about generating litigation. It's not about generating damages. It's about protecting creativity and the expectations of those who invest in the creative process. But inevitably, when there's enough money at stake, when you raise the numbers high enough, people will, will find the interstices of how, an, how a regime operates and find ways to profit from it. So reform and trademark, probably hopeless. So I'll skip it, and we're late anyway, and it's not the trademark society. But in copyright, I think actually the statute is more sound. I think there's less need for reform. To some extent, the judges, and, and after all, the Copyright Act does contemplate and does charge with the courts the role of shaping, forming, and, and developing, you know, in a, in a common law sense, how it will be applied. The judges are doing that themselves, and, and I'm sure that Steve's going to point out that a lot of the stuff we're seeing in the Wright Haven case and elsewhere, the cases is, is stuff that is happening at the trial court level. Who knows where, what's going to end up by the time things are settled, things are vacated, things are, are reversed or, 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 or affirmed, whatever the case may be. I do know, think, though, yes, we need to take a, a very good look at the attorney's fees concept where you can demonstrate an infringement with no actual damage, but by virtue of having Met the formalities, you're entitled to the full range of attorney's fees. There is a distortion of incentives there. It's not good for us in the long run as, as copyright lawyers. It's certainly not good for the common good. Um, statutory damages, you've heard about it, probably not stopped for two days. It, the courts have always been clear that there must be some rational relationship between statutory damages and actual damages. And what's called rational, what's called out of bounds, what's called unconstitutional. That's the game we're playing in right now. Thank you.